Well, this is a glorious occasion. Welcome to this annual James L. Barker lecture. Uh, this is a college event, the College of Humanities, and Scott Miller, Dean of the College of Humanities. And we're pleased today to honor a member of our faculty, a scholar in the area of uh, language and linguistics, who will be receiving this award. We appreciate your attendance. We know you'll be well uh, served for attending here today. It's a great event. We can read more about the namesake, James L. Barker, uh, of this lectureship in a program that we hope will be forthcoming before the end of the lecture. It's on a truck wandering around campus uh, trying to find its way down here right now. Uh, but we do have some descendants of uh, Professor Barker here with us today. I'd like to invite them to stand and be acknowledged for uh, their continued support of this award. So with the Barkers. Oh, they're probably wandering around campus, too. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll recognize them a little later on. This year's recipient, Professor Jeff Turley, will be duly and suitably introduced momentarily, but I would like to invite all former Barker lecturers who are here in the crowd to stand as well for recognition. So if you've received a Barker award in the past, please stand and be acknowledged. We'll begin today with an invocation offered by Rob Smead, Associate Professor of Spanish Linguistics and a colleague of Professor Church. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to be united here together to participate in this event we are grateful for this university and this college that allows us to provide perspectives from academia as well as from our faith and religion. We are grateful for the Barker family that has so graciously continued to support this event and to continue to provide us with meaningful experiences related to what we do in this college in humanities. Heavenly Father, we are especially grateful for the gift of language, which allows us to communicate with one another, but also with thee, and allows us to learn of the truths on this earth, as well as the eternal truths. And we are lastly, but most importantly, grateful for Jeff Turley and his leadership, his collegiality, and the fact that he has been both a friend and a colleague to many of us for many years. And we are very grateful for him and for what he is continuing to do at this point as our department head. Father, please bless us that we may learn from this and may take from it, and that we may sense the spirit in which it is given and be thus edified. And these things we pray for in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, before Professor Curley's formal, and, oh, there is some seating over here in the side in the back. So if you want to go around. Uh, before his formal introduction, which will be offered by Louis Fales, a assist, associate professor of Spanish and Portuguese phonetics, I will present Jeff with the plaque that makes him the lecturer that is now then qualified to give the lecture. So, Jeff, yeah, <laughs> <that's laughs> <that's laughs> I am going to say just a word or two about Jeff because I work closely with him in his capacity as chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, Jeff is a remarkable individual, he's a remarkable scholar, his work, the two books that he published simultaneously a couple of years ago are remarkable tomes uh, involving really rare kind of scholarship in the language and areas that I can appreciate slightly because I come into some of it uh, in my own discipline and I am just thoroughly proud to be known as his friend, or at least to assume that I'm known as his friend. Um, <laughs> And I have to say, I really, I, I admire his open heart, I admire his open mind, 
and I am really envious of his keyboarding skills. So um, now let's uh, now that the Barker family has arrived, let's uh, have them stand for a moment so we can acknowledge their presence and thank them for uh, their support of this lectureship. I think that has family members here. Would you raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you as well? Now that you've been credentialed, I'll turn the introduction over to Professor Bale. Thank you. It's indeed a pleasure for me to introduce to you my good friend and colleague, Jeff Turley. My path first crossed with Jeff's when we were young without even realizing it. Jeff grew up on Camorra Crest in Woodland Hills, California, right across the street from a Thales family that just happened to be my dad's double cousin. And so we lived in Northern California, but whenever we traveled south, we stayed with them and uh, went to church, played out on the street, and didn't even realize it. Um, with no idea of how our paths would cross in the future. Our paths next crossed when I was a young, new professor here at BYU. In my third year, one of my students in Spanish 626, a course in phonology, was Jeff Turley. Bright, capable, hardworking, he was clearly, he clearly garnered the best in class status. Discussing it with him recently, he said, yeah, you only gave me a 99 on the final. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then he said he still has it. So uh, that fits with a plaque that uh, you'll see if you visit his office that was given to him by a student with a, a quote that he would often use in class. After responding to a question, he might, would say, I may be wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> uh, following the completion of his master's degree at BYU, Jeff was off to the University of California for his PhD. I clearly remember helping him load up for the move. But Susie and I were talking about that this morning. Jeff began his career as a professor of Spanish linguistics at BYU over 30 years ago after completing his PhD in Romance Philology from the University of California at Berkeley. He has taught a wide range of Spanish courses over the years, ranging from medieval Spanish literature to Spanish phonetics, usage, theoretical syntax, and the history of Spanish and the Romance languages. His scholarship is also broad in scope. His early publications centered on the Spanish pronoun system. He knows more than anybody about say, and if you've studied Spanish, you know that little tiny ubiquitous word. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions about how to say, say or when to use it, ask Jeff. Um, <coughs> But during the last uh, third of his career, he has concentrated on transcribing and translating early modern manuscripts dealing with the Iberian expansion in Asia. His two most recent monograph length publications are first, the transcription and translation of the so-called Boxer Codex, a 16th century Spanish language anthology that was produced in the Philippines and which describes 16 Asian polities, and second, a translation of a lengthy and substantive 17th century memoir by Garcia de Silva y Figueroa, Spanish ambassador to the Shah Abbas the I of Persia. Over the years, Jeff and his family have forged close ties with students while directing study abroad and internship programs in Mexico, the Caribbean, and Spain. His hobbies include playing keyboard instruments, classical and jazz, and hiking, cycling, and rock climbing, 
with his wife, Susan Quedman, also an accomplished pianist and vocalist. I give you Jeff Kirby. Thank you. Uh, Willis and, and Bob, we've been friends and colleagues for 40 years or so. It's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of Spanish linguistics together. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. And the, uh, the descendants of James Barker, the, the Blackhursts who are here, they're, they're my friends and neighbors for a long time. So um, it's, it's sweet to have that connection with them today. Um, so, the question that I would like to pose today is why do some language errors catch on and become permanent while others sort of vanish without a trace? For example, the name of Key West in Florida came about as a misunderstanding of Spanish cayo hueso, which means bone K. A K is a small, low island made of sand or coral. It was called Cayo Hueso by Spaniards who discovered that the island had been the site of an indigenous graveyard. Many years later, when English speakers encountered the word Hueso, they heard West and started calling the island Key West. Surely at some point, somebody, maybe even a, even a balding Spanish professor, must have pointed out that Hueso means bone, not West. But for some reason, the mistake became permanent, the official name of the island. By contrast, an error such as the following that I heard on the radio last month will in all probability never catch on. Reporting on the White House's recent reactions to allegations, an NPR correspondent said, it's been almost a fuselage of attacks from the president <laughs> regarding the whistleblower. Fuselage of attacks makes no sense, as you know, Fuselage means the body of an airplane. Uh, this is an interesting error because it almost sounds right. And it was uttered by someone whose job it is to speak accurately and clearly. My hunch is that in the heat of the moment of a live national interview, the reporter, who's very capable, spontaneously formulated what linguists call a blend, a word formed from parts of two separate words. In this instance, I think the two words were probably fuselage and barrage, fuselage. Um, both of these words mean about the same thing, a bunch of guns going off at the same time. But here's the point of, of the example. I sincerely doubt that this new meaning of fuselage will now spread through the journalistic community and eventually find its way into Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Also, while I think everyone would agree that the use of fuselage in this context is a mistake, I don't think the translation of Calle Hueso as Key West would be cited as an example of a language error. And I'm curious why not. And I hope my curiosity is a little bit contagious today. So um, I need to limit the scope of what we're talking about when we say language errors, uh, which I tantalizingly dangled in front of you in the title. So today I'm going to focus on a certain class of language errors. <clears throat> I, I need to tell you first what we're not going to be talking about. I'm not interested today in slips of the tongue such as pronunciation er errors, like when you accidentally say black boxes instead of black boxes. I'm not going to be talking about things like spoonerisms. Uh, for example, the legendary church usher who said the following to a woman who was attempting to sit in another person's place. Martin me, madam, that pie is occupied. Allow me to sew you to another sheet. Um, and neither will I be talking about so-called Freudian slips, that is when you mean to say one thing, but you say a mother. I mean that other. <laughs> and finally, I will not be concerned with usage errors like irregardless, or I could care less, or with non-standard or dialect errors such as I seen, we was, ain't never done nothing like that, or she's got a ticket to ride, and <laughs> she don't care. <laughs> What I am interested in are errors that occur when someone misunderstands or misperceives a word or phrase and then reproduces that misunderstanding in their linguistic production. And I'm interested in why some of these errors, like Key West, take root and flourish, while others, like a fuselage of attacks, die on the vine. 
The process involved in the creation of the kinds of mistakes I'm interested in today can be described very simply. First, someone encounters a word or phrase that for some reason is unfamiliar to them or seems unsuitable, perhaps because it's illogical or not expressive enough, and so they alter the expression to improve it or fix it. That is, they change the form of the word so that it matches something more familiar to them or that seems more appropriate. This fixing requires that the two words be phonetically similar for the sake of continuity. If the new and improved word or phrase catches on and enough people adopt it, the change becomes permanent and general. So here's an example. Uh, in the 18th century, people from England living in In India during British rule encountered the Hindi word sirsakar. I'm just making up the pronunciation. I don't know how that is. <laughs> uh, to describe a kind of striped, light, puckered cotton fabric, like you see here. A critical mass of, of um, let's see, where am I? Oh, sorry. This word had originally come from Persian shir o shakar. Literally, again, making that pronunciation up. Literally, milk and sugar. The milk representing the smooth parts of the fabric and the sugar, the puckered parts of the fabric. A critical mass of English speakers changed sirsaka to sirsaka, even though the fabric had nothing to do with sears or suckers. Uh, but not knowing Hindi, speakers preferred seer and sucker because they were more familiar to them. Linguists have a name for this process. It's called folk etymology. Uh, this is obviously not an ideal term because it doesn't seem to match the process I just described. This phrase or term folk etymology is actually a direct translation of French etymologie populaire and German folks etymologie and like many direct translations, it is not optimal. Folk etymology sounds like what happens when a non-expert invents an incorrect etymological explanation based on speculation, urban legend, rumor, hearsay. And in fact, uh, this is the sense of folk etymology that one encounters most frequently among non-specialists. Ironically, this popular sense of folk etymology is an example of itself. <laughs> um, in a moment, I'll describe the more technical sense of folk etymology, but first, let's look at an example of the popular non-technical understanding of the term so we're clear about what I'm not going to be talking about. The origin of the Spanish word gringo has always resisted explanation. One frequently repeated story that I bet a bunch of you could tell me right now, because you probably heard it, is that during the Mexican-American War, when Mexican soldiers heard American soldiers incessantly singing the popular song Green Grow the Rashes O, based on a poem by Lord Byron, or the Irish folk song Green Grow the Lilacs, uh, that they interpreted this green grow phrase and, and, and Mexicanized it to, to gringo. Uh, the problem with that explanation is the word was already 200 years old. Before that. And that's documented in Spain. So, uh, well, most people, well, what most experts say today is that gringo actually comes from the Spanish word for Greek, griego, which was applied to Irishmen or Englishmen living in Spain who spoke Spanish badly. The idea is that their Spanish was so bad it might as well have been Greek. So this is an interesting piece of oh, okay, there's a, an interesting piece of evidence corroborating this. So this is a line from a story written by a 19th century Spaniard, Antonio Flores, and it says, "Pues mujer, hablo yo latino gringo, no te he dicho que muchas gracias," which means, "Woman, am I speaking Latin or Greek?" Haven't I said thank you very much? So the word gringo actually means here Greek. Um, <clears throat> Let's leave this incorrect understanding of folk etymology behind now and turn to the more technical sense. So as I've mentioned, the process of folk etymology used by linguists begins when a sizable group of speakers finds that a linguistic element will simply not do. They therefore substitute it with another element that sounds sim similar to the first one and which they feel is an improvement over the original. 
There are several reasons why a word might seem unfamiliar to somebody. As we've already seen in the case of seersucker, the word might be borrowed from a foreign language, a language that most people don't know. Uh, another example of something like that is in English, um, and it's the case of sirloin, which comes from medieval French, sur, I don't know how to say it in old French, sirloin, even at loin, yeah, or something like that. But the, the first element, this S-U-R, sur, in French comes from super in Latin, it means above or over. So literally, up over the loin. Um, but this first element was unfamiliar to most people, and so they substituted it with the word that sounded the same and was more familiar to them, sir, S-I-R. It doesn't make sense, but it, it sounded more familiar. This change was facilitated by a story that was spread around that one of the English kings, and it could be, uh, there's a number of you know, possibilities, Charles II, Henry VIII, James I, was so enamored with the loin of beef he was served that he drew his sword and knighted it. <laughs> so loin. Uh, it's not how it happened, but that's a good story. A second reason a linguistic element can be unfamiliar is that it is the sole survivor of a dying word family that is no longer recognized as a legitimate word. For example, during the 17th century, um, the French word quatre entered English. Quatre means four. Uh, but only in a very restricted context, in the context of gaming. And so you get expressions like cater point, meaning four points in a game, or four at dice or cards, or something like that. Eventually, this word became associated with the four corners of an intersection, and finally to the procedure of cutting diagonally through the intersection. Hence, cater cornered. By the 19th century, this sense of four, associated with cater earlier, became obsolete and was forgotten. By that time, cater meant diagonally, exclusively. It was now a kind of linguistic orphan, a word that did not belong to an existing word family in English. And so speakers altered it so it could fit into an existing word family. And the family it got introduced into, or adopted into, was cat. And so we have cat a cornered, and then catty cornered. But caddy isn't really, I mean, it is a word you can act caddy, I guess, but caddy is not the real diminutive of, diminutive of cat, it's kitty, right? So caddy corner becomes kitty corner, or kitty corner, and that's where that came from. Um, another reason folk etymology happens is that a word might be recognizable, but there just might be another similar sounding word that's more suitable, more expressive, more appropriate, and so, for example, this is back to French now. In the history of French, one of the popular names given to the sacramental bread or the wafer used during the Eucharist was pain enchanté, literally uh, bread for singing, referring to the singing of the mass. In popular speech, this phrase was improved, quote unquote, to pain enchanté, meaning enchanter or magic bread, which is more expressive and suggestive of the miracle of transubstantiation. Folk etymology is sometimes facilitated by a coincidental overlap in meaning, a semantic bridge, as it were, between the original item and the new and improved one. We've already seen this in the case of Cayo Hueso, being wrongly translated as Key West. But what facilitated that is that Key West happens to be the westernmost of the keys in the Florida Keys. Another example is wedlock, which comes from wed, which means wed, and lock, L-A-C. Thus that second element really meant action or practice. So the change from L-A-C, lack, which became obsolete, uh, sorry, that element changed to lock, L-O-C-K. And that's how we get wedlock. Again, facilitated by the fact that marriage, couples are kind of locked, some might say shackled, uh, together <laughs> in marriage. Another example is Belfry, which was originally a movable siege tower. Like that's in the Belfry, that kind of Belfry. The word take traces back to French berfry or berfoi, which came from medieval Latin berefredus. The Latin word in turn comes from this, from Germanic berg and fritu, 
meaning a secure high place. The bird part is the secure thing, and the free is the high place. Uh, during the 15th century, English documents begin to show uh, something more like Berfra, and then eventually, when these siege towers, that this word ceased to be applied to siege towers and began to be applied to bell towers, we get belfry. So that's where that came from. So again, um, the the meaning helps uh, bridge that gap. But here's the surprising thing: sometimes folk etymologies don't require this kind of semantic bridge. Um, that is, the new and improved form just needs to feel more familiar. In other words, even if the new expression doesn't make sense, it's still an improvement in the sense that it is at least recognizable. A compelling example is um, the German word for this. So German speakers, what's this called? No German speakers. Thank you. There's one German speaker, and he's a good one. It's Hans Keller. <laughs> so I've been told that this is the most difficult German word to pronounce if you're not German. Uh, I'll give it a shot. Eichhörnchen. How'd I do? Good. Believable? Um, the thing about this word is it comes from two elements, the first meaning oak and the second meaning quick. But that second element became in German horn, which means just what it looks like, a horn. Uh, so literally, eichhorn is a oak horn, and then you get the diminutive form, this is what most Germans use now, the little oak horn. There's nothing about an oak, I mean, I mean, there's a hope. there's nothing about a horn associated with, I mean, in the picture I found a squirrel that sort of has a horn, so you can understand this, but, um, um, but really it doesn't make any sense. But, but these words were more familiar to German speakers, and, and so this, this was preferred to them than having this archaic thing that they didn't recognize. Um, here's another example from French, a lot of French today. Uh, there's an expression in French which is this, parler français comme une vache espagnole. It's literally to speak French like a Spanish cow. And it means to speak French really poorly, really badly. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. But here's where it came from. Uh, the original expression was probably something like this, parler français comme un gavache espagnol. So gavache, which is cognate with the Spanish word gavacho, if you're Spanish speaker, you may know that word, which ironically, the Spaniards use in a pejorative way, derogatory way, to describe French people. <laughs> uh, but, but what that word really meant, and Occitan, now Occitan is a group of dialects spoken in the south of France. In that dialect, it was someone who lives in the Pyrenees, a montagnard, so a, a mountain person. And there were, some of these were on the Spanish side, some were on the French side, right? So it's to speak French like a Spanish mountain person. That makes more sense. But as this expression spread, people, you know, away from that area didn't really know what Cavache was, so Vash. Sounds, even though it makes zero sense, right? <laughs> and I can't really resist this, but um, maybe the cows in question spoke ox -aten. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the cow saying, ole, again. <laughs> um, here's an example from Spanish that is, is sort of similar to Spanish cows in France. Um, Spanish has an, an expression, no hay moros en la costa, and it, and it means literally, there are no moors on the coast, and it refers to, um, you know, the presence of menacing North African Muslim pirates along the southern coast of Spain. When this expression traveled to the Americas, people lost any connection they had with this idea of moors, moros, didn't make any sense. Uh, and so it gets changed in a lot of dialects, especially in the Caribbean, to It doesn't make any sense, but the word is more familiar to them, so they make it down. One last fascinating example of folk etymology, the word is crisscross, which comes from Christ's cross. Um, beginning in the 16th century, school children were given a simple one-page primer containing the alphabet, the numbers, and a prayer or two. This sheet of paper was glued to a wooden tablet with a handle and was laminated with a transparent sheet of horn for protection against grubby hands. Because of the horn laminate, these primers were known as horn books. Here's three examples right here. 
Often the, the alphabet was preceded by a cross. You can see that in the middle picture. There's a little cross at the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, to remind the children of the holy purpose for which they were learning the alphabet, or to ward off the evils that might accompany education. <laughs> a common formula children repeated before reciting the alphabet was, Christ's cross be my speed, all virtue to proceed. Because the letters were placed in rows on the horn book, the alphabet became known as a Christ cross row. In fact, uh, that was shortened to Christ cross. So there was a time in English where a Christ cross was alphabet. This was shortened to Christ cross and then crisscross. And I didn't mean for there to be a, a TM symbol there. Um, <laughs> that's going to indicate the vowel shift from Christ to Chris, which was normal in the history of English as part of what's called the Great Vowel Shift. Um, so thus, in 1635, Francis Quarles could make the following didactic play on words. Christ's cross is the Chris cross of all our happiness, meaning the cross of Christ is the ABCs, the beginning, the foundation of our happiness. Now, the spelling of the first element of Chris was altered uh, oops, sorry. Uh, to, to Chris cross, and um, this is a form that occurs nowhere else in the language, Chris. There's no, there's no C-R-I-S-S. -I -I Word. So where does that come from? This seems to be sort of the opposite of a folk etymology. We've taken something very familiar, the word for Christ, and turned it into something that's not essentially a nonsense word, Chris. So how does that work? Well, it turns out that uh, English is chock full of forms that are like this, where one of the, uh, the alliterative, alliterative pairs, um, where one of the elements might be a nonsense word. Things like tick-tock, flip-flop, hip-hop, Mishmash, flim flam, hodgepodge, hokey pokey, et cetera, et cetera. There's tons of these. So in a way, this was a, a move towards something more familiar, which was a, an established kind of pattern of, of making these pairs of words. Um, another uh, source, a very common source of etymology are toponyms, or place names. So earlier this year, my wife Susie and I were fortunate enough to accompany a group of BYU students on the Camino de Santiago, the Way of St. James, a 500-mile medieval pilgrimage route that traverses the north of Spain. The final destination of the Camino is the burial place of St. James the Great, who believers affirm is buried in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. Generations of pilgrims to Santiago have been taught that Compostela derives from the Latin Campus Stellarum, uh, field of stars, literally. According to legend, the burial place of the apostle was indicated to a Galician hermit by a beam of starlight, apparently with laser-like precision. Over, the, over time, Campus Stellarum supposedly evolved into Compo Stella. It's a great story, if only it were true. But alas, this etymology is actually impossible because the first syllable of Compo Stella, the co sound, could not possibly derive from the Ka of Campus in any dialect in the Iberian Peninsula. A more believable source for Compostela has been suggested, which is Compositela, a diminutive of Composita, Latin word meaning well maintained fallow field, the local meaning of which was abandoned cemetery, which is what the original location where the city would eventually be built had been during the Visigothic period. In time, the story muscled its way into the story of the word's development, and the original sense was forgotten. And yes, I am aware this is the second reference to an abandoned cemetery in my talk. Uh, and, and, and though you're dying for more examples, and that's good. <laughs> Another example of folk etymology uh, of placing this closer to home, with the Purgatory River in Trinidad, uh, Colorado, a beautiful place of the country, um, was for a long time known as the Picket Wire. River. Another example is even closer to home. Rio La Virgen, the Vir Virgin River in southern Utah, gave rise to La Virgen, even the Virgin Utah. That's just the understanding of La Virgen. So now that I am approaching the end of my talk, it's probably a good time to explain the title. Um, there are at least three other types of language errors closely related to folk etymology: egg corns hops and jobsons, and mondegreens. All three involve linguistic changes that make the unfamiliar familiar. Start with hops and jobsons. 
Hobson Job, Jobson is the title of a historical dictionary published by Sir Henry Ewell and Arthur Cook Burnell in 1886. It contains words that entered English from Asian and South Asian languages during the British rule in India. The term Hobson Jobson itself arose from British soldiers witnessed Muslims beating their chests and chanting while marching in procession on the day of Ashura. Um, <clears throat> on this day, Muslims, especially Shia Muslims, commemorate the martyrdom of Hussein, the son of Ali ibn, uh, ibn Abi Talib, who was the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad during the Battle of Karbala. Um, they also honor the death of Hussein's brother, Hassan. What they chant is something like this, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, which the soldiers mockingly transform to Hasigasi, or Hasingasin, and eventually Hubson Johnson. This last form is based on the model of two stock Victorian era characters who were a pair of yokels, clowns, or idiots. Compare Tweedledee, Tweedledum, and Tweedledee, or um, if you're a fan of the uh, Teen Teen books, uh, Dupont and Dupont, right? Translated in English as Thompson and Thompson. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they're very funny. In the term Hobson and Jobson, we see a deliberate caricature of a foreign expression that is held sacred by subjugated peoples living under colonialism. It is beyond what we might call politically incorrect. And because it's deliberate, it doesn't really count as a case of folk etymology, though it does say a little bit about the imperializing spirit. A couple of further examples from the same collection that I don't have time to examine are Juggernaut and Gentu, meaning Hindu. Okay, an, ac an acorn is a rather recent designation. The name arose when a linguist noticed that someone on the internet had written eggcorns instead of acorns. Concluding that there was no precise name for this phenomenon, he invented a new category called like this. There are two requirements for a mistake to be granted admission to this club. First, the new form has to be phonetically identical to the original, or nearly so. So just try saying acorn. It sounds a lot like acorn, right? Very, very similar. The second requirement is that the new spelling has to make sense at some level. For example, an acorn is more or less shaped like an egg, and it is a seed, just like grains of corn are seeds. Uh, here are a few other examples, called from the Acorn Database website, which is very fun to visit. <laughs> So I'll just let you read these. <laughs> so these examples are idiosyncratic. They were produced by individuals, not groups. But some acorns have become general enough that it is not impossible for them to make their way permanently into the English lexicon. I'll just read a few examples. Shoe in, like a shoe that you wear. Pigment, pigment of my imagination. <laughs> hone in on, instead of home in on. Bated breath, B-A-I-T-E-D, -E bated breath. Make do with, D-U-E. Peak one's interest, P-E-A-K. Per se, S-A-Y, per se. Uh, bold face lie. Uh, doggy dog world, I like that one. Doggy dog world. <laughs> On tender hooks, a mute point, uh, throws of passion, T H R O W, throws of passion, <laughs> jive with the facts, extract revenge, etc., etc. <laughs> okay, now finally, Monty Greens. Um, this term was suggested by Sylvia Wright back in the 50s in an article in which she related that as a child, her mother would read a Scottish ballad called The Bonnie Earl Amore, aloud to her. Years later, she realized that she had always misunderstood one part of the poem. She thought the line, they had slain the Earl of Moray and laid him on the green, was that. <laughs> which makes sense, right? Her term caught on. A Monty Green, then, is when a word or phrase from a song or poem is misunderstood or misinterpreted, and replaced by something more familiar. Mondegreens are thus very similar to folk etymologies. I have collected many wonderful examples, and I regret that I can only share a few with, with you now. And I'll just kind of let you read these. Um, and I must say, I apologize in advance if anyone is offended by any of these examples. On second thought, I retract my apology. Lighten up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 
children, and so I also collected a few kids speak errors. I limited myself to errors produced by people in my own family or close friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> She was little and it stuck. We still say this on family. We never say just in case. We always say just in case. Again. And uh, my grandson, the one that came up with email, uh, his father's name is Josh. And so when he heard people saying, oh my gosh, he thought we were saying, oh my gosh. And that became a pattern for him. So he started just putting everybody's name in there. He said, oh my Rachel, oh my Nico. <laughs> and finally, um, grandma was. <laughs> and worse, Grandpa was. <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to conclude, um, and, and here's the part that um, might be original, I hope. So as we compare the types of errors we've seen today, only one, folk etymology, leads to permanent change in the language. Why is this so? Let's look at some, uh, at one more recent example of a folk etymology that is becoming permanent in real time. The change from buck naked to butt naked. Again, sorry, not sorry. If you're uh, while the origin of buck naked is not entirely clear, it is certain that the expression is earlier than butt naked. Buck naked was created in the early 20th century, while butt naked is not attested until about 50 years later. As far as the origin of buck naked goes, the OED explained, the Oxford English Dictionary, explains that the expression may allude to the resemblance of the smooth and pale skin of the buttocks to buckskin, compare the expression in the buff. Alternatively, it is possible that buck reflects the common practice of stripping slaves naked for inspection by potential buyers. This sense may be reinforced by the former reference to male Native Americans as bucks, which is deplorable by modern standards, but was common for a long time in American history. Now, coincidentally, it so happens that the alternative and less vulgar variant, stark naked, is also a product of folk etymology. Stark, in this context, comes from Middle English start naked. So for many, many years, maybe a century or so, people said start naked, which traces back to Old English start, meaning tail or rump. It is related to the German dialect word stets, with pretty much the same meaning. So start naked was almost synonymous with butt naked. The change from buck to butt meets all the criteria for folk etymology. Butt naked just doesn't make sense anymore, fortunately. But butt naked does, and it's nearly identical phonetically. It's more logical, and it preserves the folksy emphatic sense of the earlier form. My point is about that the change from buck to butt is, well, sh should we consider this change an error? Probably no more than start naked must have seemed like an error to those speakers who still use start naked. It might be argued that this is simply an instance of linguistic change and innovation. But from the perspective of older speakers, I'll bet that butt naked feels like an error in the same way that I'm sure everyone in the room feels that pig pigment of her imagination is an error. If a, mer if, a, if a member of my generation were to point out to a younger person that butt naked has changed over the last 20 years or so, they might acknowledge the fact but will that knowledge persuade them to renounce their generation's word in favor of an earlier correct one? Or conversely, even if a person from my generation were persuaded that a sizable majority of speakers of American English now say butt naked, is that old person likely to stop saying buck naked and switch over to butt naked? Probably not. 
and their reasons might be that they are too proper or polite to use that word, but they also might feel that it's simply incorrect. Please notice that we're not just quibbling about definitions of what is correct and what's an error. We're talking about the emotional reactions produced in different speakers by linguistics, linguistic forms to which they feel a very close allegiance. Young people have told me that but naked, right or wrong, is their word, meaning their generation's word. Part of their identity is tied up in their allegiance to this and many other words and pronunciations of words. So while they might acknowledge that a change has taken place, they might feel uncomfortable with the suggestion that they are committing an error. All of these errors, the hops and jobs and eggs and so forth, are different from folk etymologies because they do not become permanent. In fact, they can be described that way, folk etymologies that don't survive, and why not? And I'm running out of time, so I'm just to um, flash through this. So I've compared these kinds of errors. You can see that the source of incomprehension that people feel when they're faced with a word they can't understand. If, if uh, a child, um, their lack of understanding comes from innocence. Um, innocence is not ignorance. But we know that children will someday, someday be, become more knowledgeable, more sophisticated, and they won't say things like just in case of you the rest of their lives. They'll, they'll overcome that. But a person that says, you know, a mute point, they're pretty much stuck there. And that's ignorance. And, and we, as more educated speakers, we judge them. And we're annoyed. I mean, that kind of error is just annoying, right? But a kid that says, just in case of yeah, that's funny. But that funniness is actually an impediment to that error ever becoming uh, accepted. Because it implies a great deal of incongruity. Um, whereas uh, something like caterpillar, you know, that's, that's going to be, did I talk about caterpillar? I didn't talk about caterpillar. Well, uh, you know, seersucker, something like that. There's, there's continuity. It's not a big shift. It's not a big jump that one has to take. So um, to really appreciate the difference of how we react emotionally to children's errors compared to how we react to the errors of our peers, uh, just imagine how you would react to an adult who says, eat meal. Not so adorable anymore, is it? Uh, now recall the history of sirloin. What are your emotions regarding the change from sirloin with a U to sirloin with an I? You're not nearly as irritated by that as you would be by someone who says, for all intensive purposes. Because the reason English speakers who made this change were confused by sirloin was not their damnable ignorance, but their excusable ignorance. In other words, this is my final point. Folk etymologies catch on because they fix a problem. They take something that's incomprehensible and they fix it. They, they supply a reasonable error. And errors and, and these new words, they don't come about from one speaker who had this brilliant idea. You know, uh, let's call seersucker, seersucker, and then spreads to everybody. Something like uh, an error like this that becomes general makes sense. And it probably occurred to a lot of people in a lot of places, and that's why it caught on. I was going to tell you about humble pie, but I'm going to eat humble pie and not do that. Um, so let me conclude with this. Um, if a particular social behavior becomes widespread and acceptable enough, it ceases to be censored, no matter how previous generations may have felt about it. In linguistics, we talk about hit etymological changes using the metaphors of natural selection. One form evolves or develops from another. Some forms survive while others become extinct, etc. This metaphor works because since the work of the 19th century so-called neo-grammarians, linguistic change was seen as natural and inevitable in the same way biological evolution was. But in one very important way, biological evolution and linguistic evolution are different. There is no sense in which an evolutionary development could be thought of as a mistake but all linguistic innovations must have been perceived as wrong, at least to some members of linguistically conservative groups who resisted those innovations. Their eventual universal acceptance masks this fact, as does the passage of time. A Latin maxim states, factum valet quod fieri non debuit, what ought not to be done becomes valid when it is done. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.